بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما والحمد لله رب العالمين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم First of all I want to thank people for the response that we had on the website. It's very promising and I think there's definitely an interest in having these casts. So we are very grateful for people that are really taking the time to listen to what we have to say. Hopefully it'll be beneficial and edifying. It's Monday, July 31st that we're recording this. And this morning's paper that I looked at, I'd just like to put that there for people to think about. So there's a little Lebanese child that looks like a girl it, who's dead. No crime, either on the day when those buried alive will be asked for what crime were they buried alive and those people buried under that rubble I think that is a question it's a, it's a rhetorical question God's not going to question them because they're sinless so children buried under rubble is it's actually quite shocking and, but more shocking to me is the lack of response what, what's been deeply troubling, I think, for me, is the fact that there's not an immense sense of outrage. There's not people uh, in very large numbers uh, responding to these things. In fact, uh, today on Google's website, the number one downloaded story was about a, a model that died in a car accident. So this, this is the state of my country. It's people that are in a deep state of heedlessness about what's happening in the world. I was deeply troubled that there was no sense of outrage in this country that this administration immediately dispatched a supply of bombs to the state of Israel instead of being an active agent in trying to create a ceasefire it was actually fueling the fire and these are not political statements, by the way. These are moral statements. It's as simple as that. I'm not making any political statements. I'm a citizen of, of this country. I'm here. And these are things that concern me ethically. That if people are engaged in immoral acts, and there's immoral acts on all sides, so I'm not going to play some kind of melodramatic black and white card here because I'm not interested in melodrama. If you want melodrama, there's plenty of it dished out every day from Hollywood. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in getting to some deeper understanding about what's going on. So uh, in, in, in light of, of this headline, Israel pauses airstrikes after 37 children killed, and that's the official number which often differs from real numbers. I'd like to read from a book called Jewish Theology by Rabbi Kohler, written in 1918 before Israel was a state. And he was at the Hebrew Union College. It's a very, very extraordinary book, but I just want to read one little section from... Jewish theology. Even to dumb beasts God extends his mercy. This Jewish tenderness is an inheritance from the shepherd life of the patriarchs who were eager to quench the thirst of the animals in their care before they thought of their own comfort. This sense of sympathy appears in the biblical precepts as to the overburdened beast the ox treading the corn, and the mother beast or mother bird with her young, as well as the Talmudic rule, first to feed the domestic animals and then sit down to the meal. 
This has remained a characteristic trait of Judaism. Thus, in connection with the verse of the psalm, his tender mercies are over all his works. It is related of Rabbi Judah, the saint, the redactor of the Mishnah, that he was afflicted with pain for 13 years and gave as reason that he once struck and kicked away a calf which had run to him moaning for protection. He was finally relieved after he had taught his household to have pity even on the smallest of creatures. In fact, Rabbi Gamaliel, his grandfather, had taught before him, whosoever has compassion on his fellow creatures, on him God will have compassion. So that's from a text on Judaism that tells us about the tenderness of the Jewish religion and I think that it's really important right now for Muslims, Jews and Christians to really think about how far we are from our practice, from our traditions, from what they're telling us what we should be doing. Because the problem is not religion, the problem is an absence of religion. That's the problem. It's not religion, it's an absence of religion. Jonathan Swift said, we have just enough religion to hate one another and we don't have enough to love one another. And that's at the root of this problem. And I think Muslims, we have to return to our tradition and be faithful to it. And we can only call the Jews back to their tradition if we're practicing our tradition because we're hypocrites when we tell others that they should be practicing what their tradition tells them to do. The Quran says that the Jews have nothing until they apply the Torah. They have nothing. They have no leg to stand on. There's no moral leg to stand on. But, but the same can apply to the Muslims. The Muslims have nothing until they apply the precepts of the Quran. And the Christians have nothing until they apply the precepts of the Gospel. But that's, that's where I see is the root of the problem here is that we're not practicing our faith. And innocent children are the victims of the stupidity, of the arrogance, of the inability for the adults to solve their problems in a civilized way, in a way that sets aside all of the tribal concerns. But I think Muslims, uh, Muslims in the United States should call upon Jewish Americans that, that they need to really think deeply at the abandonment of the State of Israel, of these principles that are rooted in Judaism. Uh, in, in, in the Proverbs, in the Bible, uh, God says, if we believe that it's a revelation from God, the Proverbs says, feed your enemy when he's hungry and quench his thirst when he's thirsty. And the Jewish rabbis commenting on that say that in order not that your enemies hate increases, but perhaps by showing acts of kindness their hate will diminish. Because that is the goal. The goal of the Abrahamic faith is unity. It's not to separate people, it's to bring people together. And another thing that the rabbis say about this, and I just read this in a text, a Jewish text on Jewish ethics, is that commenting on that, one of the rabbis said that it was very important to always try to win your enemy over to become your friend and not to create a permanent enemy. And I think that's as much, for me, a truth that Muslims need to really internalize as well as the Jewish people because we're children of Abraham and I know that Abraham is not pleased with what's going on. I, I'm absolutely certain of that. If I'm certain of anything in this world, I am certain that Abraham, whose sons and daughters, the daughters of Isaac, the daughters of Ishmael, whose sons and daughters are suffering because of the inability of political leaders, the inability of political leaders to actually work towards the betterment of our conditions. So that, that's my statement about what's going on. I'd like to continue 
in the uh, content of character because I, I truly believe that the crises today is an ethical crisis. It's a metaphysical crisis. It's not a political crisis. The, the absence of ethics and metaphysics from politics is, is what is creating all of this. It's, we don't have political crises. We have ethical crises. We have people that are not living ethical lives. They don't have ethical concerns. Their ends and purposes in their actions are not moral ends and purposes. They're venal. They're based on greed, on covetousness, on pride on what the Christians used to call the deadly sins and, and that's what they do, they cause death and destruction the sins of pride, the sins of anger, ira, anger that's one of the seven deadly sins is to become angry we, we looked at the hadith here last uh, time that we did this which was about cleanliness the next uh, hadith is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Ayat al-Munafiq Thalath Iza haddatha kathab wa iza wa'da akhlaf wa iza utumina khan rawa al-Bukhari wa Muslim which is called Muttafaqun Alayh The Messenger of, of Allah said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the characteristics of a hypocrite are three when he speaks he lies when he gives his word he breaks it and when he's given a trust he is unfaithful which is related by Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim. A hypocrite is somebody whose internal and external realities are not congruous. What's going on inside and what, what, what appears to be going on are not the same. And the Prophet ﷺ said he has three signs. When he speaks, he lies. I was speaking to a friend of mine today and from Saudi Arabia and he told me that it, it was so surprising to him how one of these uh, political leaders in the Middle East a religious leader who's involved in politics how his his popularity had just risen by leaps and bounds in the current crisis and he, he, he was troubled by that and, and he said when when he asked people because he works in, in advertising, so he actually does polls and understands how to elicit uh, those responses and what you can do with that. But when he asked them about it, he said the only, the, the, the most common answer was he doesn't lie. And so that, this is one of the major problems that we have. We have leaders who lie. They don't speak the truth. The Native Americans you say white man speaks with a forked tongue. There's, there's two tongues. And, and that's a major problem. People, the hypocrite is a liar. He, he has a double consciousness. He doesn't, he doesn't speak uh, what's in his heart. In, 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 the, uh, in the Iliad, there, there's a wonderful uh, line in the Iliad where Achilles uh, says the, the one thing that he hates more than anything in a man is that his tongue does not translate his heart. His tongue does not translate his heart. And, and that, was, that was odious to the Arabs before Islam. They considered lying to be really the, the, the most uh, despicable human quality was to lie. And that's why truthfulness to them was everything. If, if one, the worst thing that you could call an Arab in, in, the, in the Jahili period was a liar. And then the second quality is when he gives his word, he breaks it. So making promises. How many, how many politicians are, are guilty of that? Making promises and then breaking them. And it goes on, as you are, so are the people put over you. So that, that's, that's also a, a dangerous sign. When politicians make promises and break them, it's often an indication of the quality of the people. So that's another aspect of the hypocrite. And when he is given a trust, he is unfaithful. The greatest trust that we've been given is to be caretakers, stewards of God on earth. The khulafa. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I'm placing in the earth one who is there to maintain the earth. In the apparent absence of God. God is not absent, but there's an apparent absence of God. So 
That's the, the worst breaking of the trust. Herodotus, the great Greek historian, wrote that of all peoples, and this is uh, several, uh, almost a, really almost a thousand years before uh, the prophets of Lysidim, he said, of all peoples, no one takes an oath a sacred trust more serious than the Arabs. And that, that was a quality that they, they had, that even the Greeks recognized that from afar. And Muslims have an immense sacred trust from God. And, and in not honoring that trust, we, we reveal our hypocrisy. Now, there's a lot of talk about a war on terror, and that terror is the, the enemy. One of the things that I really feel that that we need to think deeply about is that's terror. And if you don't think that's terror, you know, if you don't think that those children, when those bombs were falling, they weren't terrorized, then we need to redefine the word. I see terrorism on all sides, but my honest and gut belief is that the Muslims have largely been a benevolent force in, in the last hundred years. They, don't, they, they haven't had the power that other nations have had. But if you look at the, the colonial period, that was Europe aggressing upon the, the Muslim lands. And if you look at the current situation, I see Muslims being aggressed upon all over. If we want to stop terroristic activities in the Muslim world, we have to stop the terrorist activities against the Muslim world. So the war on terror, if it, if it has any reality at all, it, it has to stop terrorizing Muslims. Because people, people are people, and I, I'm, I'm opposed to violence that is not self-defensive. I, I became a Muslim, and my understanding of Islam is that it does not sanction violence unless it's for self-defense. And it certainly does not sanction violence against civilians, against non-combatants, against women or children. The hadith against killing, the prohibition of killing women and children, they're over, that, that's one of the few hadiths that is mutawatir. It's, it's actually stated by uh, so many people that it's impossible for it to have been a, a, a lie. And it has the same authority as the Qur'an. That hadith, Naha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an qatr al-nisa'i wal-awlad. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited killing women and children. That hadith has the, the same authority of a verse in the Qur'an. To such a degree that the Maliki scholars said that in cases of self-defense, while it was prohibited to kill a woman on a battlefield if she was trying to kill you, if you see an enemy woman on the battlefield, you should not seek her out. You should actually try to avoid her in the battle. Because of that prohibition, it was so strong. That's how the jurist understood it. So if, if there's going to be any success on, on, on removing uh, terror and the threat of terror, it's only once we realize, according to Caleb Carr, one of the most uh, brilliant military historians, in my estimation, in the United States, According to Caleb Carr, until we recognize that all assaults against civilians is terrorism, nothing's going to change. It's not going to change. It's, it's only going to get worse. Th those acts are creating more and more people in extreme states that are going to want to do extreme things. And unfortunately, our country is complicit in that, and it's a tragedy, but we really need to think of new ways of dealing with these problems because the old ways are not working. They're making things worse and I think everybody knows it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us his mercy, his grace, his lutf and may he restore the true teachings of Judaism uh, to those people uh, there in that region.
May he, may he restore those meanings that I read at the beginning of this uh, to, to the hearts of those people so that they can, can really fulfill that divine injunction to be people of mercy. And that's a Quranic injunction. It's an Abrahamic injunction. It's certainly a Christian injunction. We need more mercy. And, that, and that's the, the Prophet ﷺ said, Afshu salam, spread peace. That was his first khutbah in Medina, spread peace. We want to see a ceasefire. We don't want to see conflagration. We don't want to see more uh, assaults, more trouble. We want to see peaceful resolutions to these problems. But it's only going to come when, when, when we really look very seriously and real at these issues and, and stop all of this lying, all of this prevaricating, all of this falsehood. Just stop it. We need to stop it. We need to stop talking about democracy and freedom. This is not about democracy and freedom. It's about oil. That's all it is. It's just about oil. It's as simple as that. And just be honest, because if you cared about democracy and freedom, you'd care about it in the Congo, you'd care about it in Rwanda, you'd care about it in places that nobody cares about because there's no natural resources there to exploit. And if, if Iraq didn't have any oil in it, they'd be just like the Mauritanians were 10 years ago. Nobody would care about them. Now they care about Mauritania because there's oil in Mauritania. So that's the condition, but I just want to see all the lying stop. I, I really want the breath of fresh air of honesty to, to, to come in through the windows of our souls. I'd really like to just breathe in that breath of fresh air of honesty and just hear people speak truthfully so that the dust can settle and we can really look at this uh, situation as it really stands. Jazakumullah khairan wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.